near Kenya. And so you can imagine that if peace came to Uganda, real peace, uh, I mean, great things will happen in this land. And our children will have a hope. Right now, <coughs> if you go to the U.S., you'll find young people of ordinary citizens in Kenya and in Tanzania working in the U.S. who have studied and lived in the U.S. And the only Ugandans you find are, are children of uh, ministers and, uh, and people in government. You know what that says? Absolutely. Now Kenyans have begun having people, young people who went to study in the U.S., and to work there who are coming back to establish businesses. Praise the Lord. Some of these businesses like uh, uh, where you, you can borrow money, airtime from Airtel, are owned by those young boys. Praise the Lord. And then here, having a passport is a privilege. Can you imagine? It's a privilege. They, they ought to be giving them out at the district where you come from. It's a privilege. I mean, so many things are inverted. And so, we can't afford to go through another season like that. No, God will not allow it. Amen. Hallelujah. I may sound political, but I'm not. I'm just telling you the truth of God's word. God will not allow it because there is a generation after us that uh, will not take, you know, gimmicks. So God has to help us. Amen. And I believe that as a church that God is bringing, uh, the Spirit of God is blowing our way. And the analogy that I can use is that when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, Many people wondered, can God provide meat in the wilderness? Can God provide bread in the wilderness? Praise the Lord. And the Lord told Moses, I am going to do so. And Moses asked God, are you go how many cows are you going to slaughter? Where are you going to get them from to feed these people? And God said, I am going to do it. You tell them to prepare. Praise the Lord. And the following morning, the wind of the, of the Holy Spirit blew and brought quail, and it covered the entire land. And so you could be there and you're asking yourself, well, how is God going to do this? The wind of the Holy Spirit is going to blow, and you better be ready. Amen. Amen. So as a church, we need to be ready to take in the harvest that God has for us. Hallelujah. I would have shared a dream I had many years ago, but I, the Lord brought it back. I will share it in due course. So as a church, we decided that we, we want to establish life groups uh, in our midst and... Uh, the purpose is really the way the word sounds is that we can do life together in small groups, that we can grow roots as, as individuals, that we can find places of intimacy to grow. Places of intimacy to grow. Someone has done a research and they have said that if someone belongs to a group of about seven people and not more than 17 they will find that that group is small enough to get to know one another and to op uh, to get to know one another but it is not so big that they will fear to open up it's so it also even works in reverse when the group is so small, three people, someone might think, ah, then these people can go and tell my things. But when the group is a little bit bigger, then you're thinking, hmm, it's fair. So anyway, 
uh, research has shown that most people, even the quietest of people, once you put them in a small group, they will begin to open up. They will begin to share their lives. They will find intimacy right there. And the problem of living in cities like ours, especially away from family, is that most of us are actually living alone. Praise the Lord. Most of us are living alone. How many people you get to speak to your family members on a weekly? You speak to your family members on a weekly. Brothers and sisters, not, not, not children, husband, you are forced, you are living with your husband and children. So not, not children and, and husband, your, your family, bloodline, sisters and brothers, you speak to them on a weekly. Put up your hand. That's it. Praise the Lord. So most of us are really just in the middle there. And so if, if you as well come to a church where you just sleep in and sleep out, then we are lost. Amen. Any shock will take you out. And so as a church, we want to provide that space on a regular. We want to provide that space on a regular. So we've decided uh, to begin to talk about this and to introduce uh, uh, what life groups are about. And last time I was telling you that um, we have a number of goals for our life groups. One of them is that we will uh, find a sense of belonging. And that's what we're talking about last time. And find unity in the body of Christ. That is important. Praise the Lord. Number two is that you, as you belong to the church, you can connect and find fellowship. You can connect uh, with fellow believers and find fellowship. Praise the Lord. And number three is that in those small groups, you can grow. You can grow. You can grow as a child of God. And I remember us reading that Ephesian scripture and saying the will and the, and, the, and the purpose of God is that you can grow to your full potential in God. You can grow to your full potential in God. And that's why we, we are here. Praise the Lord. And then number four is that you can serve others meaningfully. The reason we are here in the kingdom of God is to serve is to serve humanity, to bless humanity. Praise the Lord. So we want that to happen. And I was also saying that it's important for us to remember that Jesus' ministry on earth was just three years. And for me, I think that if that can sink in, everything will make sense. It was three years. 36 months. And in those three years, he had to reach out to people who had never heard about him. And in those three years, he had to share his agenda with those people. And in those three years, he had to show them that he is the Messiah so that they can believe. And then in those three years, he could now call those who have believed to begin to walk with him. Hallelujah. And then in those three years, he had to equip them from being fishermen into being people who are going to change nations. Hallelujah. And so you, you just imagine the concepts that Jesus had to share with his disciples. The Trinity. Some of us even don't understand. Some, some faiths even don't believe there is a trinity. He had to teach those fishermen about the trinity. He had to teach them about the Holy Spirit. He had to teach them about love. He had to teach them about humility and service. He had to teach them about prayer. 
Amen. He had to teach them about the gospel, preaching the gospel. He had to teach them about death, about life, about resurrection. No wonder some of them reached a point and said, but Lord, why don't you show us the Father? And that's enough. How many years? Three years. And then he had to leave them, the Holy Spirit, and be absolutely sure this thing is not going to fail. Amen. That's the, the reality of it. And so, I began to say that Jesus had a way that he had to do this in order for it to be successful. And so I want to take off some time, maybe two Sundays, to just examine how did Jesus disciple this man? How did Jesus disciple this man? And I remember sharing with you that, uh, that Jesus' life on earth and his ministry has been studied by a number of scholars. And they have told us that he basically had about three or four phases in which he took his disciples. The first phase was about 15 months. And I'm going to share on it. And then the next phase was about nine months. So those are 24. And then the next phase was about two years or one and a half. And he was done. And he was out of here. Praise the Lord. So number one, we see that Jesus used a methodology that is called sequential learning. And I want to explain that. Jesus used a methodology that is called sequential learning. Sequential learning requires the learner to embrace concepts in a given order. Sequential learning requires the learner to embrace concepts in a, in a given order. To learn the first concept before the second concept before the, th the third concept, before the fourth concept. Praise the Lord. And, um, and the opposite of sequential learning is basically non-sequential learning. If you look at the book of John, you see that uh, the apostle was trying to introduce some concepts in the book of John to his readers that basically was to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And some examples we see in the book of John, and if I read them, you will just recall to mind that at one point, uh, John writes about Jesus as the Lamb of God. Yeah? At some point, he talks about him as the bread of life. He talks about him as the light of the world. He talks about him as the good shepherd. He talks about him as the vine. Praise the Lord. All these concepts, light of the world, lamb of God, bread of life, they, when you put them together, they are talking about the Messiah. Amen. But you don't need to put them in any order. I could come today and I tell you, you know, about Jesus as the light of the world. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then he was manifested into the earth. And then he became the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot hinder it. Praise the Lord. Oh, I could talk to you about the vine. I, I don't have to have spoken about him as the light if I'm to talk about him as the vine. Praise the Lord. The Father is, is the, the plant. Jesus is the, the branch. I mean, is, is the, the, the Father is the, the dresser, the one who dresses the vine. And then we are 
the branches. And then I can talk to you about fruitfulness. And we don't have to connect it to what I said before. And so non-sequential learning can introduce concepts that don't need you to have known A before you know B, before you know C. When we talk about sequential learning, <laughs> the best example I can give is like the English language. For us to learn the English language, we have to first learn the words, and then we connect those words into phrases, yeah? And then we connect those phrases and talk about grammar. Isabel should be teaching these things better. And then we can write an essay. So I cannot come here and tell you, can you write me an essay? You remember how we used to write essays in S4, S3? Boom, boom, boom. The <laughs> Amanda, the drum sounded. This is eh? And then he came through tiptoeing, and everyone was wondering, who is that? He had no form. Do you remember writing essays in S2? Can you write an essay if you don't understand the words? You have to know boom and the effect that it brings. And then you have to connect boom and, and some sound effects and, and stuff like that. Praise the Lord. You remember how we were taught mathematics? You start with what? <laughs> Maths. What do you start with? Addition. Counting. Huh? You start with addition and subtraction. Before you go to anything else. After addition and subtraction, then you begin doing what? Multiplying. After multiplying, you begin dividing. Zero divided by ten, everyone gets how many zeros? Zero. And then you ta start talking about geometry and angles and tangents and cosine and then dy dx and so on and so forth. Praise the Lord. So, imagine that you're going to primary school or secondary school and they come to your teacher and they say, this guy, you're going to teach him the history of Africa. You're going to teach him the history of Europe. You're going to teach him the geography of America. You're going to teach him mathematics up to this level. You're going to teach him essays. You're going to teach him biology, science. You're going to teach him life, living and non-living things. This is what you're going to teach this guy. And then they drop the books, bam. What will happen to your teacher? They will just collapse. But if you take all those things and divide them equally into 12 years, and then you just bring the first few things and you say, this guy... This year, you're going to teach him A, B, and C. That's enough. Next year, you're going to teach him D, E, and F. The following year, you're going... Everyone will say, when are we starting? Praise the Lord. So, the same thing happened to Christ. He had to come. No wonder he said, he spoke to Nathanael and said, you, when I tell you that I saw you under a tree, you think that is big? A time is going to come when you're going to see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. But I think he was saying, you're going to see graves open. You're going to see a host of angels appear. You're going to see dead men show up in your cities. You're going to see people in the grave come back to life. But if he had told them, these are the things you're going to, you're going to see me die. You're going to see me. They would have said, ah, I'll see you. So Jesus taught his disciples in a sequential way. There were phases. They were very, very distinct. Praise the Lord. 
And you could tell that these people have moved from this phase and now they are ready for this phase. Unfortunately, as a church, we get you born again, bam, like the other is a boom, boom. And then we tell you, do you know why you took long to get saved? There is witchcraft in your village, like this. And then we start telling you about the strong demons in Uganda, if you're in Uganda. We give you the list of the strong demons. And then we tell you how you were bound up to your great-grandfather. And then we start teaching you warfare. You don't even know when you will come out of it. It will not work. It will not work. So a gentleman called Bill Hall, this guy studied the life of Christ. And he argues that Jesus had a phase uh, of discipling his people, which he calls the come and see phase. And I'm going to explain a few things. I'm glad even my time is up. I'm going to explain a few things here because I don't want to say many things and confuse you. But it's important that we, we understand these things. When Jesus came, he had four things that he wanted to do with his disciples. Number one was to cause them to believe or to teach them some beliefs. Number two, he was to teach them behaviors. Number three, he was to teach them habits. And number four, he was to teach them some character traits. What is a belief? A belief is an acceptance of something that it exists or is true, especially without proof. Praise the Lord. So when Jesus came, he wanted people to believe in the Father who sent him. Amen. And so that is one of the, the concepts in his ministry that he wanted to put across. Number two, he wanted to teach them some behaviors that are befitting of the kingdom of God. What is a behavior? It is a way that someone conducts himself. And so as if you a believe, you are called a believer, God expects some level of conduct before others. Amen. Number three, he wanted to teach them habits. What's a habit? A habit is a settled tendency or manner of behavior. In other words, that becomes your new nature. That becomes your new nature. Praise the Lord. And then he wanted to build character. Character is an attribute or a feature that distinguishes an individual. Praise the Lord. So we see that Jesus wanted people to believe in him. That is coming from the Father. Two, he wanted people to change the way that they live. Three, he wanted that change to become permanent or second nature. And four, he wanted them to be distinguished. Hallelujah. Can you imagine that that is exactly what God wants to achieve in you? And not only in you, but now through you, he can achieve the same in others. Amen. And yet for many of us, these things just take years. They say, why are you still drinking? You know I'm still a work in progress. Why are you still drinking? You know I'm still a work in progress. You know we are saved by grace. We are saved by grace. There are even f teachings or, 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 or ways of beliefs where people think that, you know, in this flesh we can't stop behaving like that. Don't worry about the flesh. God doesn't look at the flesh. He looks at the heart. He saves the spirit. So you can just struggle with whatever you're struggling with. Don't worry. Jesus had three years to transform these guys. So these scholars argue that 
Jesus had distinct times. And the first phase that Jesus brought his disciples through is a, disciple, is a phase called come and see. Praise the Lord. And there is an interesting uh, phrase in the book of John where uh, someone goes and tells his brother and says, come and see the man they told us about. Hallelujah. It is said that this lasted about 15 months. And then there was a phase which is called the follow me phase, which lasted about nine months. And so the come and see phase started when Jesus began his ministry until the time that he called them to come and he will turn them into fishers of men. The third phase is called the be with me phase. And the fourth phase is called remain in me. A story is told of a father who had a daughter and that daughter had a birthday. And so the father said, but why do we keep buying uh, birthday cakes? This cake thing is a simple thing. I'm going to make one for her. And so he dashed to the supermarket and bought some uh, cake mix. It's called cake mix. Bought some cake mix, bought some milk and uh, ice cream, and, and uh, icing, sorry, not ice cream, icing. And said, this thing, I'm going to cane it. So on the box was written that you get a pan that is about, uh, about, about eight. Now, of course, the, the Bazungus use uh, different dimensions. But basically, he got a pan that is a little smaller than what he was directed by about an inch or two. So instead of it being maybe eight inches, he got one for seven. And so mixed the, the cake mix, put in the milk, and uh, poured it in the, in, the, in the pan. And when he poured it in the pan, he could see that the thing just rose up to about four inches, halfway or, or quarter. He said, this will work. Mixed it and threw it in the, in the oven. The thing began to rise. It began to rise, it began to rise, and it began to overflow. At that point, he realized that if I leave this thing inside for longer, I'm going to lose everything. So he rushed and pulled it out. And when he pulled it out, he realized, oh, anyway, I have more than enough. So he decided to cut off the top and just use what's left. At that point, he needed to cane the cake or knock it out of the pan. And when he tried to knock it out of the pan, he realized the hole appeared on top. Why? The thing had not set properly. So he chose to overturn it and cane it through the other side. And he was successful. He pulled it through. But it had holes and so he decided, after all, I'm going to put icing. So he decided to purge the holes with icing. The thing was still hot. So every icing that he put just began to melt. Some of it disappeared in the hole. Some of it over, was just overflowing. He decided that the owner of the cake needs to get this cake before it gets worse. So he presented anyways the cake to his daughter. The daughter looks at the cake and says, Daddy, can you promise me one thing that you will never again try to make a cake on my birthday? Praise the Lord. The purpose of sequential learning is that one thing needs to go in fast. And it needs to go in so well and settle. And after it goes in so well and settles, then you can add the next. And after that goes in and settle, you can add the next. Praise the Lord. So we see that 
when Jesus called his disciples, this is well described in John chapter 1 to chapter 5. I would want you to go back and just uh, um, study these scriptures for yourself. Number one, we see that the goal or intent was that Jesus was drawing his disciples to himself and he wanted them to recognize his identity as Messiah. Praise the Lord. And so for some of them, he told them their names before they could tell him, uh, before they could introduce themselves. Praise the Lord. Some of them, he spoke to them from afar. Hallelujah. So we see John chapter 1, God is telling people, you are Tom. And you are a Muganda. And maybe you come from this place. And they're saying, wow, this guy is the Messiah. Praise the Lord. And all he's doing is just introducing himself. They must have a wow moment at that point. They must believe that what we've waited for all these years has finally come. Amen. You know, for me, when I got saved, a man was preaching at a crusade in Jinja and he was talking about the end times. And he was saying a time is going to come when the heaven and the earth is going to be rolled away. And it was about to rain. And the wind was strong. So the clouds were running. So I looked at the clouds and I said, but isn't this what this man is talking about? The heavens are going to be rolled away. So I wasn't mesmerized by Christ. I just said, man, if you don't get saved today, these things are going to be rolled away. You're in dogs. That's why I got saved. I'm sure if I asked everyone here, why did you get saved? People will tell you, man, I, was, I had debt. I had debt. I saw I was not going anywhere. I was vexed. But the intent that Jesus had is to reveal himself as Messiah. No wonder there are people who get saved, but they just don't fear God. They have never seen him as the true representative of the Father. They never came to a place where they can see this is the life that I've been waiting for. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, you're telling the same things. If you don't get saved, you're going to die. If you, don't, you just imagine if Jesus showed up and he was telling them, you guys are dead. You're finished. Hallelujah. He wanted to reveal his identity. Praise the Lord. So we see that at that point, the disciples didn't have to live with Jesus. They would come. They would see him. They would bring their friends and they would go. And, and we see that, for example, after John chapter 1, we go into John chapter 2, we see that they next meet at the wedding in Cana. So they are there like his friends. And Jesus is still showing his identity as the son of God. So the wine runs out. They come to the mother. They tell the mother. And he says, you tell him. Tell him that the wine has run out. Praise the Lord. And, and he's saying, woman, what does this have to do with me? But we see that at that point, he commands them to prepare the water and to take some and to give to the master of the, of the wedding. Did they say that Jesus prayed? The believers of today, they would have said, the wine has run out. Is there a prayer room nearby here? show up in the prayer room, you pray in the Holy Ghost, and you call wine. No, there was nothing like that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we see that there were some distinctive uh, uh, aspects of this phase. Number one, that Jesus did not talk about commitment at all. In this phase. In fact, the only commitment in this phase was baptism, which actually began with John the Baptist. So there is a phase that God brings you into the church, 
And all you have to see is see the greatness of God. Hallelujah. Number two, we see that everything that he did was around events. The baptism, the wedding at Cana, the woman at the well, and so on and so forth. Number three, we see that he focused on beliefs and behaviors. Because those do not require commitment. He never talked about habits and character. He just talked about beliefs. Do you believe? Do you believe? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then we see that uh, it was about attraction. Jesus was winning their trust rather than engaging them in any form of training. So Jesus was trying to win their trust to him. And finally, we see that it was about salvation and just enough commitment to go to the next phase. So the twofold goal was to bring the disciple to a place of belief that Jesus was the Messiah and then just create a level of willingness to go to the next level. Do you remember John chapter 4? We see the woman at the well. And Jesus is talking to this woman. And he's saying, you know, um, uh, about her husbands. And he's saying, you've had five husbands. And even the one you have now is not yours. And then the woman goes back to the city. And tells the men of the city, come and see a man who told me my entire life. Hallelujah. I call it casting the net. And so this woman goes and brings the whole city to Jesus. And when he brings the whole city to Jesus, they don't even tell us what he spoke to them about. Because that was the first. He's just introducing himself. He's showing them that he's the Messiah. He's asking them to believe. That is all. Hallelujah. But now we realize that one, this is just a beginning phase, but it is critical. It is very critical for you to understand that Jesus is the bread of life. For you to understand that Jesus is the light of the world. For you to understand that Jesus is the son of God. For you to see all these miracles, and these miracles are not calling you to a place where you will dwell. You know, our church has miracles. You know, in our church, we see miracles. There are times we would be in church and you would see the pastor laboring to pray for the lame, that the lame must walk. Why? Not because you want to attract other people, but because they can take the clip, put it on TV, and show our pastor is a power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so without knowing, why did Jesus perform miracles? Do you know that those miracles were in the come and see stage? No commitment. In fact, many of the people who chased after Jesus, they would bring their sick and say, please let our sick touch the helm of your garment. And many of them touched and got healed and went. We don't hear about them. Hallelujah. Do you know that they had left life behind and they had gone with healing? Do you remember the lepers? The ten lepers? What happened? He said, you go and show yourself to the priests. And as they were going, they were healed. And the nine went. And to Jesus it was okay. But one came back. Hallelujah. If God is going to get us to where he wants us to go, we must be willing to go through these phases and to say it. And to say it. Praise the Lord. So that now God can bring us into the next phase. And the next phase. Most of you are here and you carry titles in the marketplace. And those titles are weighty. 
because you went through a certain sequential learning system. Amen. You went through a sequential learning system. And so even as we begin to dream about life groups, we, we are just looking at you and we are saying, if these guys just went through this system and we dealt with beliefs and we dealt with behaviors and they are able to graduate out of that and we begin to deal with habits and we are able to graduate out of that and we begin to build character and we graduate out of that. You guys are going to change nations. Hallelujah. It is the process Jesus used. It is the process that people are using in the natural world. And now God is showing it to us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If Jesus did it and it worked, it's going to work for us. And it's going to begin to produce destiny in us. Praise the Lord. And so it means that as a church, we are going to begin to ask you to commit more. That is what it means. You can't just walk in here and walk out. Tell me, tell your neighbor, the days of walking in and walking out, they are over. Repeat it. The days of walking in and walking out are over. You enjoy them. By the way, you can even enjoy the second service if you want. But those days are what? They are over. The days of sneaking in and sneaking out are over. Just imagine that Jesus comes and says, guys, I've been with these guys so long, you give them something to eat. And the disciples are saying, we don't have. And says, what do you have? So they bring the lead, the few fishes and the few loaves of bread, and he multiplies them. And they say 5,000 men ate, not counting, women and children. So if we are going to give an accountability of that food, what do we need? Don't we need people to register? They register. So you tell me, who are the people who ate the food that Jesus produced? Well, who are the people who ate the food that Jesus produced? Can say Mwalimo Jenny. There must have been a Jen somewhere. There must have been a Sarah. Praise the Lord. That is how we are running church. That is how we are running church. <laughs> Can you imagine? So that was a loss to the kingdom. It was a come and see event. You can't say we helped a number of people survive so we can call on them next time. They come and help us. And that is what's happening. Who are the people who attended the Easter Monday? Who are the people who pray here? Who are the people who give? We don't even know who gives and who does not give. Can you imagine? We can't know. How are we going to win the world like that? Impossible. Absolutely impossible. It means we're all passers by. Our time comes and it will go and another generation will come, it will pass and it will go and another generation will come and it will pass and it will go. No. I think that every one of us needs to stand out as an individual. And every one of us is going to be profiled and say, this lady can do this. This gentleman can do this. Call upon so and so, they are going to do this. Praise the Lord. It means that you become visible to the kingdom of God. As you come to the next level. Hallelujah. When, when Tabitha died and, and they, they needed Peter to pray for him, they presented a CV. And they said, this lady is the one who makes the rugs. She made the rugs that were in the, in the temple. 
She cannot just disappear like this. And Peter brought the case before God and said, man, this lady has been part of the kingdom showing up. You remember the woman who prepared a, a room for, for the prophet upstairs? And then she lost, she didn't have a daughter. She didn't have a child. And then the prophet made a case. Praise the Lord. Do you remember that when the child died, the prophet made a case? Do you remember that when she, she had to leave the land because of famine and come back? The prophet's servant made a case before the king and all her land was restored. Think about it. Imagine if the people who minister here every morning, you say, who is that? Imagine if you don't know whether I'm a member of this church. And then Dr. Tony comes and says, who is that one now? Ah, oyobala ikavale seyo mchuba. Mulabe ngiri jayo geramu. Laika mchuba. Na kuba mwao. Who is that leading the service? Ah, that lady, simu manyi nange. Is she born again? Ah, simanyi. Simanyi. Kwa te lukuba kukabala wali kati. Okay, wali haba loko lenga mkama ya baito kubuli denjiri mabala wana. No identity. Think about it. It just doesn't work. Unfortunately, the church in Uganda prides eh, to continue to grow like that. It has no face. It has no accountability. No one knows it. We know the big shots. Who is that? Ah, that man of God is a mighty man of God. Then you just see a shadow of no bodies. Where do they come from? What do they do? When the Lord began to establish his kingdom, he began to call people out of obscurity. And he began to bring them to the forefront. When they talk about the gospel in India, they will tell you, so and so took it there. When they talk about Turkey, they say, Bishop so and so. When they talk about Asia Minor, they say, Bishop so and so. When they talk about this place, they say, it means that even for you, to begin to speak to your family about the kingdom of God, you're going to have to come to come out of the come and see phase. You have to come out you have, and leave it for others. Praise the Lord. You must become distinct. You must show up. You must stand out. Praise the Lord. And that is where God is taking us. And it means that as a church, we must stand out. We must stand out. So next Sunday, I'll be talking about the other three phases because we're just introducing them. But I want you to go back and ask, begin to speak to yourself and begin to speak to yourself clearly that the time for me to stand out in my church has come. The time for me to become significant has come. The time for me to be a vessel to be a foundation on which Christ can build his church has come and I need to show up. And it's to the measure that you show up that God begins to fill you and to supply you and to use you to be a vessel. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this morning and we want to thank you for the things we are sharing on this journey. Lord, we believe that every believer has been called to stand out, to be distinct, to be strong, to be a light, to be the salt of the earth. Lord, I pray that as we go through this series, you will cause the light to shine upon us. You will cause our eyes to open and to see the thing that you have called us for. That, Lord, men and women will begin to come out of obscurity to be available for the kingdom of God to use them. I pray that every gift in this church will be accounted for. I pray that we'll show up and show up strong and we will be available and that your name will be glorified in our lives. We have nothing to hide and we have everything to show up for. 
Because the Bible says you use the nothingness of this world to shame the wise. Lord, I pray that we will find favor before you in this season. Lord, I pray that this will be a season that you will begin to strengthen us against our strong enemies and to establish us in the land and to give us the land. All for the glory of your holy name. We bless you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, this message is timely. When I came here in the morning, the Lord dropped one uh, verse in my spirit, and uh, it is really tied into his message. I didn't even know who was preaching. I thought maybe Dr. Tony or him. But the message was, uh, it, it, what it just said was, I stand at the door and knock. So I like to Google. I Googled, found where it is. It's Revelation 3.20. And um, this message is not in vain. So um, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and dine with him and he with me. So today if you've heard this message and you do not know the Lord as your Savior, it is the very reason the Lord has exposed you to this message. So I'm taking this opportunity and giving you a lifetime uh, opportunity to say yes to the Lord. If you're here and you today is your day, you feel the message has been talking to you and you want to say yes to the Lord. He's been knocking your door, knocking at your door over time, through people, through circumstances. Is anybody here in that category? Hallelujah. Brother, we just appreciate you. We welcome you. And this is, heaven is rejoicing because of what you've done. And it's not by coincidence that this message was preached, that before I knew what was preaching, the Lord placed that scripture in my mind. Please come in front. Everything is going to stop because you have said yes to Jesus. And I'm going to ask Pastor to come and pray for you to receive salvation. We honor you. And he's going to embrace you. Because you've come to the kingdom of God. You people, this is phenomenal. We can close the day. This is a life saved. Hallelujah. Pass over to you. Amen. Let's pray for Elisha. This is Elisha. Please repeat these words after us. Just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you. Because you knew me. Before I was formed in my mother's womb. You have a purpose for my life. You want to use me. To fulfill that purpose. And to serve your kingdom in the earth. Today. I have heard. The words of salvation. And I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to save me. Wash my life with the blood of Jesus. And write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Today I declare that I am born again. I have received Christ as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our brother Elisha. Lord, we thank you because we know you drew him here this morning. And Lord, your ways are not our ways. Lord, we know that your desire is for men to come to know you. Through your son, Jesus Christ. And to begin to walk that life that you have destined for them. Lord, we pray for Elisha. That you will establish him in your ways, O oh God. And even as we've been talking about him knowing you as Messiah. 
that Lord, you will reveal yourself to him and through the brethren and through the teachings of your word. Lord, you will uphold him and bring him through that phase and bring him to a place of following you, of yearning after you, of walking with you. Holy Spirit, we commit him into your hands that you will journey with him, show him the ways of salvation. May your blessings superabound. May you meet him at his points of need. May you show yourself strong in his life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and believe. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Elijah. You're welcome to the kingdom of God. And um, at the end of the service, I'm told uh, Dr. Tony is the elder in charge of discipleship. So um, he's right here. He'll meet you at the end of the service and give you initial tips. You remember what was taught today? Initial tips so that you hit the ground running. We appreciate you. I am really elated and the beauty of obedience to the Lord. Hallelujah. So uh, we just want to thank God, and uh, we just want to recognize, if I move to that, is there another person? You know, there are people who usually come last minute. Another person. This is your chance. Another person. Those online, another person. If you that person, please repeat the prayer, the Lord's prayer, accept the Lord in your, in, I mean, uh, accept, welcome the Lord into your life, repent of your sin, and ask him to write your book in the book of life, and decide and purpose to follow him today, in Jesus' name, amen. So, we wel welcome first time visitors, you're such a person, you're here for the first time, put up your hand. We just want to appreciate you. Can you imagine Elisha? Is he Elijah? Elijah is a first-time visitor. The Lord brought him here. He must have a testimony. Hallelujah. Lord, you're wonderful. Um, we had the encounter week last weekend. It was amazing. There were certain chords. A theme that cut across was mostly personal development. Um, we're going to invite a testimony. A testimony, I mean, uh, a call was sent out on our platforms by the admin. And uh, I think she didn't receive any except for myself. So I'll give that testimony. Before I do that, we're going to pray for our offerings. So I welcome the, um, our team to bring forth the baskets. Prepare your, your money to give. And on the envelope are instructions on how you can give uh, using the mobile money platforms. Give diligently. Tithe. Do this in obedience to the Lord. We're not doing it to man, but unto God. And those who can send their tithe anytime through uh, those mobile platforms, don't wait for Sunday. Do it. Immediately you receive the money. I can attest to that. I like to do that before I start with other expenses. So we pray for the offerings. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your people. We thank you because you've given them. And out of what you've given them, they're bringing back to you a portion of it. Lord, you desire a cheerful giver. Father, such people are right now here. Their hearts are elated to give to bring back to the kingdom of God, that that money be, will be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you. Testimony. After Encounter Week, for me what came across was a validation of the journey we had started as a church of going back to the root, redigging the wells. And now the theme this time was go deeper. Go deeper. You see, when you're attuned to the Lord, when something comes, when they talked about go deeper, the Lord had showed me this 
during my time alone with him, many times. Deep calls for deep. I would wake up in the morning. Deep calls for deep. So I go. Remember what I do? Google. What is that? It shows me the scripture and I follow it. I read the entire scripture. So this uh, encounter week that we had was actually to take us deeper as individuals. So my testimony is that because um, I've, I've given myself to seek the Lord, to know him, to forsake every other thing, but to know him, and I'm standing in obedience. I used to come and go like I told you. I didn't know anybody here. But the Lord impressed it upon me to start serving. So I have been diligently doing that. Anyway. So at the end of last year, I've worked for, I've had very good jobs working with the World Bank, name it. Even the last one was with a, a World Bank project, but sitting in KCCA. Um, that job ended in November, but they said a few of us would continue. But um, you, they would pay you for the time you have worked. And as a Christian, of course, I would only sign in when I actually have work. Other people could have signed in and still gotten paid. So the money coming in wasn't good. So I said, Lord, what is your plan for me? Then um, there was an opportunity Somebody reached out to me. There was an opportunity. It's a less glamorous job, but the way I see it, it is tied to God's purposes. Because God has, for the longest time, impressed upon me the thing of children, ministry, children. So anyway, this one was uh, connected to education. It's a, an education reform commission, and they wanted a communication specialist. So the offer was made in November when the other job was ending. However, there was a lot of pull and push, which I didn't know behind the scenes, until the Lord gave me that job. So I've been at that job for two months. So when I got into that job is when I realized what the push and pull was. But the Lord put me there and in the right place at the right time. Because he even revealed to me that I should start an altar. Because we are start, education is a big mountain. It influences some. So I got in touch with, they are called commissioners. It's going to be a commission like the Bamuge Merere to come up with a policy on education. So on the commission, actually, there are believers in there. One of them actually came to me. She knows Pastor Michael. She's called Irene. She knows you. But it's okay. Anyhow, so I said, let's do some prayer. I didn't know who was born again. Got in touch with the, the cleaner. She says, oh, so and so. So we started an altar. But there's blessings in this job. It actually was giving me like a pay cut, uh, less than what I was getting over there. But there's been a blessing. For the first two months, I've paid all my bills, everything, done giving, giving money. But the past two months, after the encounter, I realized money fell into my account immediately. I got out of the, the encounter, maybe on Sunday. So I called one of our chief investors here. I said, I have this money. 10 million in two months. I've saved 10 million. Two months. Paid everything else. I still have extra. So I called this investor. I said, here is the money. So it is in tandem with the message we had. When you're busy about the Lord, when you're seeking the Lord, Jesus who is already on the inside of you, we worry not about what is outside. And the Lord gave me a scripture to support that when I was a bit worried. Okay, what next? What next? He gave me Leviticus. All, all that is through that time, the quiet time. Le Leviticus 10, 26, 10, which says, You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. And the new has come. And I'm thr So I just want to thank God for his message. It's timely. And it's just to call all of us to have a personal relationship with God, to go deeper in the Word. It is interesting. You can just dwell in there until it's... You, I can't express enough. If you can see the zeal in me, please be encouraged to step into that place. The Lord will, is faithful. He'll meet you there. And He'll give you the reva revealed Word for the moment. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Okay. Finally, announcements. We have um, 
The ladies of this church are called Robes of Purple. They've organized an, an event for Saturday 14th at 11 a.m. It's going to take place here. Uh, mostly it's called, it's, uh, it's a financial management event. And they're going to uh, enable the ladies be economically empowered. And then also, students are resuming school. So we're going to say a special prayer for them. So if there are any students here who are going back to school, put up your hand. Thank you. I'm going to ask an elder to pray for them. Dr. Tony, please uh, pray a blessing over them. Please come. As they make their way to the front, if you've registered for baptism, the, the course for all those who registered is due to commence and it will be announced during the week. Thank you. Over to you. Praise the Lord. Let's stretch our hands forth. Let's wait for her. She's also coming. have many students. Hallelujah. And this, we haven't yet gone to the second service. Hallelujah. So I want us to stretch forth and pray for them that God will give them the wisdom that he gave Daniel, that in all matters they will be examined in. They will be found ten times wiser than the average person in that class. Hallelujah. They will discern. Hallelujah. Israel, aren't you going back to school? You come. Join, 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 please. Hallelujah. We want all our students to become memes, casazos. They are going to invent things. This business of waiting for Americans to create for us things. We also need to be creating some things that the world will utilize. So stretch forth your hands. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for these, our children, our students. They are in our midst, Lord. They serve you, O oh Lord God. They, they do wonderful things. We know, Lord, that they're in their phase where they are learning, they are gathering knowledge to apply in the service of the kingdom. And so we pray that you open forth, Lord God, your hand of blessing and anoint them with wisdom as you get, gave to Basilel. Anoint them with wisdom as you gave to Daniel, to Shadrach, to Misak and Abednego. Lord God, that they may be wise. They may excel. They may see things that are not even clear to their own teachers. They may perceive. They may understand. And above all, we pray that you guard their hearts, O oh Lord. Fill their hearts with your word. Fill their hearts, O oh Lord God, with yourself. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Let's stand up and close. Uh, may the grace, of the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. This is Agnes, and uh, this is uh, House of Revival. Our main pastors are Pastor Michael Kintu and Esther Kintu. God bless you. Go live for the Lord. We thank you and we rejoice with a heaven, heavenly uh, host for a soul that has been saved today. That's the highlight for today. Hallelujah.